Welcome all to this uh, new Alpha seminar. We have today the pleasure to receive Alexander, pleasure and honor to receive Alexander Byrne. Most of us in this group, we know Alexander through his metaphysics uh, writing because of our interest locally, but, but he also wrote extensively about many other subjects. And today he, present, he will present a very challenging or maybe provo provoking arguments. And after one hour, we'll do a short pause. Pilar, one of us, will, will make the comments. And after that, there will be a general discussion. So the floor is yours. Merci, Alexandre. Um, mesdames, Messieurs, c'est un gros plaisir pour moi que je me trouve ici à Le Val Neuve encore. Uh, malheureusement, il faut que je parle en anglais. Uh, je pense que que vous n'avez euh, pas assez de patience euh, pour euh, mon, mon français affreux. From now on, ok, I'll check it out. Just so I can, fine. Oui, you have to. But, um, ok, so I'm going to be talking um, about empiricism and, and its relationship to epistemological internalism. So there might have been another title at some point, but um, it's, yeah, it's about empiricism and internalism. Um, so, um, what I need to be arguing for is, is, is this. Um, empiricism plus epistemological internalism is incompatible with scientific realism. So, oh, uh, 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 yes, and that's, this, is really, this is possibly the important claim, probably controversial one. Empiricism without epistemological internalism is just unmotivated. If you're not, if you have, if you're an internalist, you have a reason to be an empiricist. But if you're not an internalist, you're an externalist. You've got no reason to be an empiricist. So the consequence of these two together is that either you should be, if you want to be an empiricist, you can be an empiricist and an internalist and an anti-realist. That's that's a, that's a coherent package. But well, the alternative is, if you want to be a realist, you shouldn't be an internalist and you shouldn't be an empiricist. Um, and, and this is this clearly controversial because I think a lot of scientific realists would say, no, oh, I'm a scientific realist, but I'm also an empiricist. So that's, so that's why this is, as you say, controversial or uh, thought-provoking. So what, am I, what do I mean by empiricism? Really, I'm thinking of empiricism as any philosophical view, epistemological view, that gives a central role to perception, perceptual experience, sense experience, sense data, that stuff, whatever you call it. Um, you could mean empiricism more broadly. Yeah, I mean, if you're an empiricist, you might say, well, I don't believe in the synthetic a priori. Uh, I believe that you, substantive knowledge requires some kind of interaction, maybe causal, with the world. I'm not, that, that's, that's not my target. It's the one that focuses on perceptual sense experience um, in particular. Um, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of empiricism of that kind around. So here's Quine, for example. Um, as an empiricist, I continue to think of the conceptual scheme of science as a tool, ultimately, for predicting future experience in the light of past experience. If you're a philosopher of science, you think that observation and evidence uh, are important epistemologically. So the following views turn out to, you know, are to be counters empiricist. Patrick Maher, the proposition P is amongst S's evidence, even only if S knows P directly uh, by experience. Uh, or Hassock Chang, my colleague at Cambridge, observation is an act of gathering information. The so observation is important. Observation is an act of gathering information by human sensation uh, without optional interpretations. Um, as I said, a lot of realist philosophers of science are empiricists. So, uh, so uh, Anjan Chakravarti, 
use a realist as a view of observation that's much the same as Hassop Chang's, who you know, I think of as an anti-realist, although he might dispute that. Um, and Jan says, there are things that one can, under favourable circumstances, perceive with one's unaided senses. Let us call them observables. Yeah. All that sort of stuff that you read in standard philosophy of science. It's all in Perisys because it links observation, key epistemological concept in, in philosophy of science, with, uh, with perception. Clearly, almost obviously, Bas van Fransen, you know, an anti realist philosopher of science, links observation to perception. Okay, so uh, these are just, well, just the things I've just quoted. Um, so, uh, actually, on the following slides, I will be writing observable subscript P to um, you, for the term observable as these guys use the term observation. Why do I do that? I do that because that's not yeah, yeah. That's not how scientists use the term observation. You read, you look to scientific papers, look at their titles of scientific papers. They talk about things like uh, observation of gravitational waves resulting from the collision of two black holes. Right? Yeah. They think it's perfectly sensible to talk about the observation of a gravitational wave. Right. Utterly imperceptible. Uh, and and yeah, you can see that from not just gravitational waves, but observation of you know, pi mesons under certain circumstances, dot, 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 so forth. So, scientists don't use observation in this way, linking it to perception, but fossils of science uh, and epistemologists often do, and that's why I'm putting that P there, to be clear that that's the sense of observation that we're, we're working with when we, when we are. Um, I mean, I think that the scientist's usage is the better one, and I think there's a good reason for it, but I'm not depending merely on an ordinary language argument that scientists use it this way, therefore philosophers must as well. I'm not, I'm not going to assume that. I might conclude that, but I'm not going to assume it. Um, so here's... here's um, um, What's on, what's on these slides? I can't remember from these slides. I'm sure I look at them on. Okay. Okay, so here's my, my, my potted history of philosophy, <laughs> uh, which is really dangerous territory for, for, for me. Um, but what I, um, I, I think of the debate between, the historical debate between empiricism and rationalism as a debate about uh, uh, basically about foundations for for knowledge um, and I take both empiricists and rationalists in the 17th century to be looking you know, particularly at this time of you know, scientific revolution post renaissance so you're looking for um, Foundations for science, for new thought, in uncertainty. Um, and the difference between empiricism and rationalism is about where one can find this. And the empiricists are saying, well, one finds it in and exclusively in experience, um, sense impressions if you're human. Whereas the rationalists think thinks that there's a faculty of rational intuition that you know, delivers uh, self-evident propositions. Um, but from my point of view, what's interesting is as a, what, what they share in common. You know, this this search for uh, certain foundations, and I think that this search for uh, certain foundations. Uh, certain foundations is motivated by uh, epistemological internalism. So let's turn to, to internalism. Um, actually, this shouldn't really be an if and only if. This should be, this should be just an only if, but 
Um, so I should have changed that. Um, okay, so what I'm saying here is this is what I take internalism to be. Look, there's all sorts of debates about what the right way of characterizing internalism is and how the different characterizations do relate to one another. But here, this will, this will do for our purposes, I hope. And it's the idea that if some thinker is justified in her belief, then that's only because, or it has to be the case that only if, she can become aware by reflection of all the facts relevant to her being justified. So here's a condition on justification. What makes the subject just justified is internally accessible to her, <coughs> accessible by reflection. So it can't be the case um, that I'm justified in my belief, but I am not in a position to see that I'm justified or why I'm justified. Um, it contrasts, um, for example, with a simple <coughs> externalist view like this, which uh, well, I'm calling simple reliabilism, to, that says that a subject is justified in her belief um, when her belief is the result of a reliable process of belief formation. Um, so that's externalist, not internalist, because on this view, yeah, as long as the process is reliable that links the world and my belief, that's sufficient for justification. I do not have to be in a position to, by reflection, see that this link is in fact reliable. Uh, causal theories of knowledge you know, are also externalist. You know, so that's this stuff I'm sure is familiar to, to everyone. But this will be my contrast, yeah, my contrast case. If, yeah, there are reasons for thinking that simple reliabilism is false, but I'm using it as a, as, as it were, my template externalism. Because um, I need to be arguing, look, it's sort of simple as this, right? If you are a reliabilist, if you think this is a good account of justification, then you've got no reason to be an, uh, 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 an empiricist, right? Because nothing in this says, or you know, there's no good reason thinking that the only reliable belief processes of belief formation are ones that involve sense perception. Um, Indeed, some of, the, some, of the, some of the reasons that some people give for rejecting reliabilism um, find that implausible. But for my purposes, what the point is, as well, you can, if you believe this, you, should, you don't have to be uh, an empiricist. So one of the sort of test cases for uh, reliabilism is you know, Mr. Trutem, you know, this individual who has a, who's connected to a thermometer and is a, it, it has accurate beliefs about what the temperature is. The question is, yeah, if reliabilism says that this person is justified and can have knowledge of what the temperature is, even if they're unaware of this, 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 um, uh, why they have that belief and that is reliable. Yeah, there's similar arguments about clairvoyance. Yeah, some people think. Yeah, I, I can understand why that these are reasons for rejecting simple re reliabilism. But my point is that you know, the true temp case shows that if you believed that, you wouldn't have to be an empiricist. Because you just have the beliefs, right? <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't have to, who says that they have to come through sense experience? You know, some, if you get wired up to the world in the right way, that's, uh, and it doesn't go through sense experience, that's good enough. Okay. Internalism will reject that. Okay, so let's get back to some philosophy of science. Um, okay, so this is something I call the pessimistic deduction. So not the pessimistic induction, the pessimistic deduction. And it goes like this. The evidence of science concerns only what is observable. 
with this subscript P. Okay. So this is a common thought to you. The evidence of science is found in observation. Brackets, philosophers, you analyze observations, perception. However, the conclusions of science often concern what is unobservable. And here's the controversial third premise. No conclusion concerning what is unobservable can reasonably be drawn from evidence solely concerning the observable. From which we can deduce the conclusion, we can't have reasonable belief in the conclusions of science. Now, of course, this doesn't have to say every conclusion of science, but you know, a lot of conclusions, many of them, conclusions of you know, whatever the best of science. Um, so for those conclusions, we can't have a reasonable belief in them. So I think that this is a, a standard sort of anti form of an anti-realist uh, argument. It's the sort of thing that's sort of implicit in Van Fraat. Well, it's not actually in Van Fraat, but it's the sort of thing that, that he, he sets out clearly what I think is at issue in many debates between realists and anti-realists. And it's no surprise that it's the third premise here is where a lot of the action is in the debates between realists and anti-realists. Because right? um, the realists will come along and say, inference is the best explanation. That, does, that, that shows this is wrong, right? Inference is the best explanation shows that you can have a reasonable conclusion in, uh, you know, uh, uh, regarding unobservable stuff from premises concerning uh, only observable stuff. And the anti would say, no, no, we don't, don't like in front of the best explanation you know, for whatever reason. So that's where a lot of the, the debate lies between realists and anti-realists. So um, you know, debates between what I call the optimistic empiricists, those who think P3 is false, the pessimistic empiricists who think that P3 is true. Why do I call them both? You know, Empiricists. Um, well, that's because it, both sides tend to accept this this premise. That's the, that that premise is a statement of empiricism in philosophy of science. Um, but the fact that they are arguing over this bit is shows that they're all uh, empiricists, um, just whether they're optimistic or not, realist or anti-realist. Whether that's that. Makes sense, that. Whereas I, what I want to do is to, to, to have some, give reasons for rejecting, uh, for rejecting that. Okay. So, um, oh, yeah, am I going to... I could talk about this for a while. Um, perhaps in the interest of time, I might whiz over this bit, perhaps. Um, of course, there are some people who want to resist this claim that the conclusions of science confirm what's unobservable. Strictly speaking, Van Frassen is one of those. Because Van Frassen doesn't actually think that we believe the conclusions of science. Um, so in, a sense, or in some sense, he accepts that the conclusions of science in the sense of what you should believe don't include what's unobservable. He thinks we should merely you know, accept uh, our best theories, but acceptance is, roughly speaking, thinking that our best theories are uh, empirically adequate. So he will reject this. And I've got a couple of slides on why Van Fraassen is the stupidest philosopher. No, no it's not stupid. He's not the stupidest philosopher. He's probably even taught you. Right? Um, but um, no, I mean, I, I, I just can't, I just can't get my head around constructive empiricism. And if you want to tell me, me to tell you why, then please ask me again. I mean, I, 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 it's just, I have a rant. I have a, you know, I start frothing at the mouth, and it's probably not for me to do that right, right now. Because it just seems inconsistent with the way that modern, modern science is done. Anyway, I'll, I'll move on. I'll, I'll, I'll come, I'll, let's come back to that. Um, um, I'm very happy to do, do that later. Um, 
Um, so look, here's my strategy. I'm going to be considering three skeptical problems that are problematic, yeah, that become problems if you are an empiricist. Um, and these concern inference is the best explanation. Yeah, that's the familiar test of many instruments. Yeah, but all these will probably be familiar. But I need to, what I need to do is to put them all into a common format. Um, and the, the common format concerns the kinds of response that you can make to these skeptical arguments. And I think that there are three kinds of response. First of all, you just accept the skeptical argument. Be an anti-realist. You can reject it, and I'd say that the standard way of rejecting these arguments is just to be an externalist, some description. Or you can reject the argument, reject the skeptical argument, and you can try and look for some a priori solution. Of course, this, is, this, one, this thing is unlikely to appeal to most empiricists, because it looks a bit rationalist. But uh, I also think that there are that in none of the cases is this really likely to be a good answer. So that these are your two. The two reasonable responses are either accept to be a skeptic and an anti-realist, or reject the argument for externalist reasons. Now, this tends not to work. Um, OK, and what I need to do is I'm going to use my model, because it's perhaps more familiar, um, Hume's problem of induction, okay. um, and show that how you know that, that, that these are the three standard responses to Hume's problem. Um, okay, then then I'll sort of move on from that Strybe and then testimony instruments. Um, okay, um, so. I'm not sure there's a reason for that slide. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I guess it's because, um, yeah. As I said, this is this is the argument here is typically about um, inference the best explanation and whether we can make inferences about what is observable from what is unobservable. Uh, in, inferences about what is unobservable from premises about what is observable. Hume's problem is a different one. It's about making inferences about what is unobserved from what has been observed. Okay, so it's not got this remote aspect. But yeah, that's the problem. That is Hume's problem. Can we, from our past experience, predict future experience? Or, um, so, look, I'm not going to insult anybody by rehearsing Hume's problem. Um, so I'm just going to go to the three solutions. Right. Look, you can you can you can have these 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 answers. Be an inductive skeptic, right? Hume, bang on. Right. Popper, right? Karl Popper, inductive skeptic. Here's another response that people can make, and is made widely in the the, the literature, including by people who taught me, like David Patton or uh, Hume and, and, and others. If they just go externalist, and they say, look, when you analyze Hume's problem um, carefully, you'll see that Hume's problem requires making internalist uh, assumptions. Um, it, seems it's, it requires that for me to be justified in thinking that just because for as long as I've known him, Alexandre can speak French, that in five minutes' time he'll still be able to speak French. Um, what, do, what do I need in order to, to, for that belief to be justified? Well, it's not simply that I just have the evidence of his being a competent French speaker in the past, but I'm able to justify my inference procedure. And then we get into the whole problem of it's all being circular. So it's internalist because my justification, my being justified, requires that I not only have some evidence, but that I'm able to show that that evidence supports 
that conclusion. And that's what. And then so the externalist response says, hey, that's, that's, uh, that's internalism. But if you're an externalist, like the simple reliabilist, you don't have to do that. It's sufficient that you've got the evidence. And in fact, induction is a reliable way of doing things. So that's the standard um, move that externalists will make in response to, to Hume's problem of induction. And of course, there is oh, um, yeah, an, a, another anti-skeptical response, which is, look, we can find, look for some a priori justification of induction. You find this in Kant, and uh, you, you find it in other authors, you find it in Strawson. Yeah, there are other, a number of people that have made attempts. You find in Carnap, obviously. Um, um, attempt to find an a priori justification of induction. My own view is that Goodman's new riddle of induction shows that this is impossible. Um, but I won't, I won't go, I won't go in, 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 into, in, into that. Um, it, it, arguably, you can try something along this, this, this line. I think, I think that's implausible. For my argument today, in this case, it's not essential that I reject that, although I will reject the analogue of this in the other cases. Um, OK, so that's Popper. Uh, that's standard externalists, um, Van Cleve. Um, Hugo, uh, Hugh Meller, David Patton, and people. So, you yeah, simple reliabilism, inductive justification is possible. And furthermore, I mean, this isn't definitely important, but it's interesting they also go on to say that actually you can, if you want to, although this is not required, you can actually justify the rule of induction itself by a circular. A, a, a non-viciously circular argument, a rule circular inductive argument. So you can um, show that inductive justification is actual. But this is a, this is a, 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 a additional. The point about externalism is this is an, a, a voluntary additional move you're not obliged to make to, for this bit to be true. Um, okay, so. Um, Three kinds of response to Hume's problem. Um, and what, uh, oh yeah, this is this is a same idea. I think the new riddle of induction just shows that that's not going to work. Um, but we can come back to, to that if you want. Um, in, let's move to inference the best explanation. Um, more germane to philosophy of science, arguably, uh, particularly that P3 we were looking at. Um, so here the question is, is it the case that better explanations, better potential explanations, do we, we put out some hypotheses, they all look explanatory of the evidence, uh, some look to be simpler, more elegant um, explanations or have some other virtues, um, things that make them good or in Peter Lipton's terms, lovely explanations, are explanations that are lovelier, better, more likely to be true. And this is what Peter Lipton calls Voltaire's problem. But it's just really the sceptical problem of inference to the best explanation. Um, yeah, we can think of there being three kinds of response. You might think that this, that, that um, yeah, there is an analogue of Hume's problem for inference to the best explanation. Now, after all, if you think Hume's problem is a problem, you'd think that there should be something analogous going on for inference to the best explanation. And you might think we just have to accept that. We can't get justification or knowledge from inference to the best explanation. Um, you could reject it on externalist grounds. Or you could try and find, you could reject the sceptical, you, know, you, you could reject 
this worry by trying to find some a priori justification, an a priori link between explanatory loveliness, explanatory goodness, and truth. Um, on the whole, people think that this is, you know, this is hope, this, this isn't going to get, 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 get you very far. But we can argue about that. But on the whole, people think that an a priori justification of inference is the best explanation. Um, it do, doesn't look like a very hopeful project. Um, so we, we can either accept this, you know, and that's, that takes us back to the standard uh, philosoph uh, philosophy of science anti-realist. Um, or we, oops, we can, sorry, uh, be rejected, and in fact, this is the this, this is the move that's made by the sort of upgraded version of the no miracles argument that we find in uh, Dick Boyd and Stafford Silos. Yeah, Stafford Silos is sort of a big book on uh, scientific realism. He he adopts an externalism to to justify. Um, or to show, show that it's, you can get justified belief using inference as the best explanation. But it turns out that actually his argument, the argument he and Dick Boyd make, is in fact the analog of the, um, uh, sorry, the additional step that um, you can make in response to Hume's problem, which is yeah. Look, if you were a liabilist, you could not only have justified belief in your inductive conclusion, you can actually do the thing of saying, well, actually, my evidence is that induction is reliable. Uh, and, and that via, that will be a, a, itself a justifying inductive argument. But since it's rule circular, not premise circular, that's supposed to be okay. And in fact, this is, and you can do the same, it, Boyd, the boyd Silos argument is pretty much the, doing the same thing, um, it, but in the case of inference, the best explanation. Um, we could talk a little bit, um, you know, but, I mean, I've just waved my hands and said that's what they're doing. I haven't you've gone into any, any detail in the interest of uh, time, but we, we could talk about that. Um, okay, so, um, as I said, I didn't think that that's, that's a, that the finding the rule right justification for inference is the best explanation. That doesn't seem to be a plausible uh, option. Okay, I'm going to look, do the same thing again. So it's going to get boring for you, really. But with, with respect to testimony and with respect to instruments. So, um, here is. Here's what's known as reductionism in the, in, in the philosophy of testimony. Um, it, we, we, we like to think, we pretty theoretically think, that you can learn stuff, have a justified belief in stuff, by hearing, getting other people telling it to you. But how? how, how? You know, why should you believe something on the basis of somebody else telling you? Something. Well, this is what we find in Hume. Um, standard reductionist, sometimes call it, some people call it the empiricist account of uh, testimony. Somebody asserts something, yeah, and so yeah, that's one of your premises. You hear them say it. Your second premise is that they are reliable, and therefore you infer that what they say is true. But an important premise is, as it were, is this is bit here that the person you are hearing this from is is reliable? So that's reductionism. Um, oh, the reason why I'll come to this in a minute. Reductionism is is important um, in our context. Is if you are an empiricist, you've got to do something like this, right? Yeah. Um. Alex wants to say something to me, like you know, what the time the trains are to, 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 to Brussels tomorrow. Look, from the empiricist point of view, all I've heard is, all I know is Alexandra said these words, right? That on its own doesn't make me justified in believing that content. So, yeah, what I, 
what I need is is to be is is to be able to have justified belief in the content is, is to know that Alexander is reliable about twenty times. Um, and that's fine because look, he, I've known, you have known him and he's he tended to tell the truth in the past. So I've got some you know, I, I, I can justify this second premise. Okay, so that's that's how that works. The problem is that the scale of the division of labor and science renders this yeah, it's very difficult to see how we could actually do this for science. Because <coughs> where do we get our information in science? Yeah. Almost vast quantities of our information in science is gained from journals. Yeah, we gain some from our lecturers. But even then, you know, how do you, you, you your student in the science lecture, right? They, they, they seem perfectly reliable. How do you know that they really, really are? So we're talking at lunch. They are sometimes aren't even. Right, okay. Um, certainly if they're professors of medicine. Um, so, um, but you read stuff in a journal. You know, you, you, it's just an eight on paper. Paper, paper. Now, there, there are all sorts of ways we, you could try and think of generating some kind of um, where, reason for thinking that you know, what's produced in a reputable journal is in fact reliable. But if you're an empiricist, that reasoning, the thinking that this that has to boil down to your own experience. But how could you have enough experience to really know that all the science that you are consuming, particularly given the, the large-scale division of labour and science, yeah, the amount of information you're consuming, the, the vast number of individuals, scientists who contribute to that, you couldn't possibly, from your own experience, have enough experience to justify a belief in the reliability of your scientific sources. So I think that if you are a... This reductionist... Uh, approach, you might work for small scale stuff like you know, getting information from people that you know reasonably well, um, whose reliability you are able to vouch for from your own experience, but that just doesn't work for, for science. Um, so then on the prime face seat we have a sceptical argument in science uh, based on testimony. Um, so if you reject reductionism, you have the sceptical argument. Um, and again, there's three things you can do when you face it with this sceptical argument. You say, yeah, um, you can accept it. Locke has says something about testimony that seems to suggest that Locke was a sceptic about scientific testimony. Look, the historians argue about this, but he does say stuff um, that seems to, <laughs> seems to suggest that he is a sceptic about scientific testimony. Testimony, and, yeah, and it was sort of part of the rhetoric of of the, the Royal Society in, in the late eighty uh, late seventeenth century that yeah, the experimental method meant you being there, um, able to see experiments done for yourself, um, possibly in a small society like the Royal Society where the other members were gentlemen whom you knew, because you're all gentlemen and aristocrats and you knew them personally, perhaps if you didn't attend a meeting you could expect, you could accept their testimony, but like me and Alexander, these are people you knew personally, or from the right social class, you knew, you could, you could trust them. Right. Um, but, yeah, but, but his idea, the basic idea that, that, that you had to be, either experienced stuff for yourself or be pretty close to someone who has, was it was a was a was a was a thing there. Look, you can be you could so next move. Reject the external re reject uh, the sceptical argument <coughs> on externalist grounds. So look that 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 uh, I just go back. Uh, yeah. The requirement that you are able to justify this premise, that look that's internalism for you. 
Um, the fact that they, it, the, the fact that the person they report to is reliable, and simple reliabilism should be enough. Um, now, Sanford Goldberg um, has a, a, an externalist response, uh, defense of testimony, but he, he, his, his reliabilism is more sophisticated than the simple reliabilism that I was you know, advertising right at the beginning, and, and correspondingly more plausible. He says that here are engaged some knowledge when three conditions are met. Um, the speaker is reliable. Secondly, the hearer basically you gathers the correct proposition from what's being said and, and, and believes it. So that's, that's, that sounds fancy, but basically I understand what you're saying. And here's a third condition. So this is where things are added to simple reliabilism. The hearer can and does reliably discriminate amongst speakers for those who are reliable. And what's important about this third thing here is, it, ooh, look, is that internalism coming back? Is, it, is, this one, is this saying the hearer must know that Alexandra is reliable, but Charles, yeah, he's just <laughs> well, 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 well. <laughs> um, um, no, it, 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 and be able to say why. Well, no, no, all this is requiring is that I'm, I'm able to, not that I know from my own experience who is reliable, who is not, just that I am able to make a distinction between them. Well, this is supposed to rule out is, the, is being utterly gullible. Right. Right. The utterly gullible people who will believe anything anybody says to them are not in a good position to gain knowledge by testimony. But if in fact I'm fairly reserved and I, 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 I will, I trust, you say people like yeah, Alexandre, but not, not, not Charles because yeah, I've only met him today, so I'm, I'm a bit, bit, so I just make that discrimination. Then even if I can't say why I think that Alexandre is rather than Charles, I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> uh, um, um, as long as I make an accurate discrimination and limit myself to the reliable, um, then that's, you know, um, that's good enough. In the science case, it might be a matter of you know, trusting journals you know, that, that are well known uh, and being less inclined to trust journals whose you know, citation indices are rubbish or, you know, you know you, 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 or you've never heard of. But, you know, we know that there are all these dodgy scientific journals out there that you know, will publish anything for money. Um, you know, as long as you think, I'm not going to trust them, but I'll trust the ones I've heard of, then that's enough for this condition to be met. So the important thing is that this is not an internalism coming in by the back door, which is not intended to be. So let's say, look, you've got this externalist approach. Now, of course, in fact, there are people who think that you can defend testimony on, intern on, on grounds that are acceptable to internalists, but like a priori methods. So Tyler Bird says, um, we are entitled to rely, other things being equal, on perception, memory, deductive and inductive reasoning, and the word of others. So he thinks actually that we have this default entitlement, and he uh, to you know, he thinks that in effect we have a, a priori justification of all these statements, including uh, induction. Um, and that includes testimony. Um, and the word of others. That's just, and he gives an argument for this, an a priori argument, which is roughly if you can make sense of what they're saying, then that shows that they must be rational. But rationality is a guide to truth. Yeah, there's this link between rationality and truth. And therefore, yeah, if there's absent defeating reasons, you've got a reason to believe that what someone is saying to you is true. I mean, that just, that seems like a pretty weak argument to me. Look, I mean, just because I know that you're rational, because I can make sense of what you say, the evidence of your saying something comprehensible is that you're rational. 
that doesn't give me much reason to think that you're likely to tell me the truth. You might be you should give me reason thinking that you might be telling me the truth, or you might be telling me a complete lie because you're a rational person who wants to deceive me for whatever reason. Um, yeah. Rational, your rationality is a sign that you could tell me the truth. If you, to tell, if you try to tell me the truth, that raises the chance of what you tell me being true. But it doesn't... That you're rational gives me no reason to think that you want to tell me the, the, the truth. So I think that Burge's argument is very weak. And we can look at science. Yeah. I mean, science is sort of interesting because you might come up with some arguments as to why the structure of science, you know, you people, you think that other people get rewarded for success in science. And um, so, so you, other people are motivated to come up with the truth, right, by the re reward and incentive structures of science. That might be a reason for thinking uh, that uh, people in science are, are, are more likely to use their rationality to tell the truth than to tell, uh, to get down and tell the falsehoods or, or to get things wrong. It's true, but actually the intensive structures of science also motivate quite a lot of people to cut corners, to engage in questionable research practices, or even outright fraud as over the border, some whichever direction is north, you know, the thing Diedrich Staples, um, wonderful. I mean, I, I, I admire his fraudulent psychology. I mean, it's just it's brilliantly done. But it's all complete fake, right? Yeah, but, and and, and the, the quantity of this stuff in science is such that you, know, you could point to us and say, look, the incentive structures of science are set up actually for, in a way that doesn't encourage truth telling always. So, yeah. I mean, a couple of things there. I don't think it's a very good argument, but even if it was halfway decent, the actual facts about science, um, you don't necessarily go along, along with this. The, the, the examples of questionable research practices and even outright frauds, just otherwise. Um, so, um, okay. So I, I think the only options with respect to testimony in science are scepticism or an externalist rejection of the sceptical argument. But, and, and possibly, again, in the interests of time, I mean, we come, we've come up to an hour, but we started ten minutes late, so I'll, I'll just... Um, so what should I do? Um, look. Um, yeah. I was going to talk about instruments, but look, I think you can see where I'm going here, right? <laughs> Inductive justification of what I'm going to say. Um, that was, this is the, the testimony thing. Look, science uses instruments a lot. Um, but we've got a similar issue. We've got an instrument that delivers some output, propositional output. You know, reading on a dial, but these days more likely, you know, a, 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 a database. Um, why should I believe what the instrument tells me? Well, because I've got this argument, right? And I need to use it because I, 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 it's, the instrument tells me that P, the instrument is reliable, therefore I believe that P. Um, and then, but there are familiar, this is the you know, reductionist argument from respect to, to, to instruments, there are familiar arguments as to why this is a problem, because you know, how, how do I uh, get to know that my instrument, or my experimental technique more generally is reliable? Look, <coughs> well, we could talk about what those sceptical arguments are, but it's, um, I mean, one way of looking at it, one way of quickly getting there is just simply to piggyback on the testimony argument. Because so many of our, our instruments are, are made, made by other people, right? Um, and we buy them <coughs> off the shelf or we get sent to them by scientific instrument makers. Um, um, in other cases, yeah, they're laden with theory, right? And that may not be theory that I'm able to justify myself. Um, particularly because 
you know, I, you know, I'm using this instrument and it's doing something clever uh, designed by you know, some material scientist, but I'm not a, you know, I'm, I'm an archaeologist, you know, and that's sort of, um, uh, you know, what, what I'm interested in is, you know, the age of this rock or bone or tooth, um, um, and I've got something clever that tells me what that uh, age is, but I'm not in a position to, to justify that theory because I'm not a physicist. Anyway, so all sorts of re reasons for, for thinking that the reductionist argument about instruments doesn't work. It, 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 same thing, get a sceptical argument, which we can either accept or we could reject on externalist grounds. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. So long as the instrument actually is reliable, then we'll give you justification and knowledge. Even, is it possibly even more obvious that the, an a priori justification of in, instruments isn't going to get you very far? So yeah, these are the two reasonable alternatives. Okay. Um, look, you, some people might say, oh, look, 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 this is, and I think this is an important thing. I think that, that often philosophers of science are quite sympathetic to internalism because they say, look, look, scientists should understand the methods they use. You can't be a good scientist and just just accept a method without understanding it at all. And I think there's something right about that. But first of all, I think that if scientists, what we expect of scientists, what scientists expect of each other, is that they should have some understanding of the methods that they use, but not a sufficiently strong understanding and justification by internalist standards. Yeah, so if I'm an archaeologist using radiometric dating, you know, using isotopes to date this rock, I should have a rough idea about you know, how isotopes, you know, you know, how there's exponential decay and different rates of different things. I guess some understanding of that, but if I were able to give a full internalist justification, uh, I, I probably wouldn't be able to do, to do that. Um, and furthermore, I think that we can, we have reasons for expecting people to be able to justify their methods that are independent of um, internalism. And basically, the argument is this: um, look, sometimes um, if we need, if we want some process to achieve a goal, we can. Sometimes, but not always, we can be expected to need to know whether our process is in fact reliable. Um, um, if you value the achievement <coughs> of your goal highly, then you might want to, uh, and, and, and especially if implementing this process or is expensive, um, then it makes sensible to inquire about which process really is going to deliver the goods. But in other cases, it may not be so important that you uh, that you do that. Now, in the case of science, you know that, that um, we're developing methods all the time, um, and we're going to be putting a lot of intellectual and other resources into into our science. It makes sense for us to want to know which um, processes, methods techniques, instruments are, are reliable um, because we care about getting to the truth um, and you know, um, yeah, and, and often, and often for, uh, which one we choose is going to, it's, it's going to, be, it's going to be expensive to do to do to do to it's going to, going to work. But this kind of justification is independent of in, in internalism. Um, so it's a bit like this, right? Um, um, in, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, so, 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 so I want, I, I, I want, I want, I want not to get COVID, right? Well, I have, I've had, I had a couple of weeks ago, you know, but, but, but yeah, back, back when it was really dangerous, and um, yeah, how do I? Um, you know, so, so I want to get, get vaccinated, right? But then I, I'm going to, since I really care about not getting COVID, um, and it's going to make a difference in my life whether this vaccine works or not, I'm going to take some interest in, um, 
in which of the vaccines are, are, are good or not. Um, yeah, and I will, you know, like AstraZeneca, you know, developed in Oxford, made in Belgium, bang on, I'll have that one. Sputnik, Putin's one. Mm. <laughs> um, 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 but that's because that, that, that is not, that sort of line of thought is not motivated by turnings, and it's just motivated by, by these kinds of considerations. <coughs> and the fact that the only way of knowing which vaccine is working is to investigate, investigate the vaccines themselves. Okay. Um, right, so let's move on. Uh, to, 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 to. Uh, that's all this okay. um, um, last couple of slides. Anyway, um, look, look, you said, look, look, look. I, I, I mean, somebody's going to say, I'm an empiricist, but I'm not an internalist, and here's my reason. Um, look, perception um, doesn't deliver certainty. So, you, you know, this intersubjective notion of perception, not. Um, um, but it does provide a high degree of reliability, and the further you get away from perception, less reliable stuff becomes. Um, you know, my perception, I really know that this is you know, a black object I have in my hand, stuff I find out with instruments, you know, my temperature with the moment, well, that's, 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 that's less reliable. Yeah, I can't be so confident because you know, I don't know whether it's reliable. You know, something that these things go wrong. Um, actually, um, so this would be a reason for being empiricist because you think that perception is not certain but it's, it's, it's better than anything else we've got. Actually, I don't think that's right. Uh, the whole point about science is perception is rubbish and using instruments is a whole lot better. Uh, think about, oh, it's a thing for temperature, right? Thermoception. Yeah, we can tell using sense of thermoception, which things are hot and which things are cold. But it's not desperately reliable. It depends upon the state of our bodies, you know, the whole thing about putting your hands in cold water and hot water can mess that up. Uh, or if you're ill, your thermoception isn't so good. And it's also not very precise. And all you can say, oh, it's hot, really hot, quite cold. You know, like, you know, nothing, nothing precise enough for science. That's, that's why we go to, 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 to thermometers. Okay, mercury thermometer. Yeah, it's, 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 it's much better than thermoception. Um, so it's over here. Still problems, parallax errors and the rest of it. Well, you, perhaps you might move to a, you know, a, a, uh, you know, a resistance thermometer or you know, with a digital readout and so forth. Or even better, you will have a method of continuous temperature monitoring uh, linked to a database where that database is goes through some analysis uh, and that gives you uh, your, your, your temperature. So I think that you know, even this sort of sense that you know, this justification for empiricism doesn't get us anywhere. But let's forget. It was a quote from Jim Bowman that says what I said. Um, okay. Um, I'm, just, I'm just going to. So I don't think. Yeah, I, oh, look, yes. This, this is what we've got to look forward to, if you, particularly if an externalist, post human. Uh, unconscious information up there. In the future, so this is getting a slightly wacky bit of the talk. Um, um, well, we won't need to read books. Well, in fact, none of us read books anymore when we were talking about this. Probably Amazon does, but the rest of us don't. Um, but, um, look, you, why, is not, why, why shouldn't stuff be uploaded into our hippocampus? Why couldn't that be done? No experience, we just find ourselves believing <laughs> stuff. Um, and I'll say, look, 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 I need to upload into your hippocampus you know, the, the periodic table. And then the next day, boy, you just have to know you know, which element has which atomic number and so forth. You will know, we'll have to have beliefs about it. Um, well, yeah, if, if I'm doing a good job of uploading that stuff into your brain, why shouldn't that be a way of knowing stuff? Um, okay, so let's finish. Conclusion. Um, so I started off with this pessimistic induction debate. I said that, 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 that there's been too much focus on this premise, uh, but whereas I think this is the one that we ought to 
um, focus on as well, or instead. Um, I looked at three skeptical arguments, inference best explanation testing instruments, three kinds of response you could make, well, only two of which I think are you know, really plausible, either being a skeptic and accept the skeptical arguments or reject on externalist grounds. You could go a priori, but we didn't really like that in any of these cases. Um, so, <coughs> these, so your options are be an empiricist, accept the skeptical arguments, so you're an anti uh, 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 because of your internalism. You should do. Um, alternatively, you can be an externalist, you reject these skeptical arguments, so you, you're not an empiricist, and it at least allows you to be a realist. And that's impossible realism. It doesn't force you to be a realist, but it allows you to be a realist. It releases you from the anti realist argument. Um, now, obviously, it's been somewhat implicit in what I'm saying that you know, I prefer to be over here. Right. But in a sense, the real, the real argument is you know, what I the takeaway if you believe anything, which is probably right from what I said, but if you believe anything, is as it were that there's a, these are the reasonable alternatives. These, these things go together. Uh, that's all I have to say. Sorry, it's taken me a long time to say. <laughs>
jam a little bit. Okay, yeah, we're good. Okay, now it's time for the, the formal comment before the general discussion, and I'm very happy to give the floor to Pilar Therese, who is a postdoc at UC Louvain. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks for this opportunity. It's been a pleasure to read and prepare the comments. Um, I would like to start by, by saying that I approach this paper with, uh, with a lot of interest because of the suggestive title and provocative title against <coughs> empiricism. Uh, my initial intuition was like, well, if not empiricism for science, then what? What do we have? What do we rely on? And then reading the paper is when I realized that my initial, maybe naive intuitions were wrong and needed to be specific, needed to be more precise. So it, it, it was a great opportunity to think about uh, what empiricism means, what justification, perception, experience, and even what's the distinction between a scientist and the scientific community also. So my, my comments will probably go in the direction of, of developing or, or precisifying a bit, a bit more all these intuitions. Um, so the first, the first comment is motivated by, so in the paper we are presented with, and in the talk we are presented with different uh, dichotomies. In particular, we have to, it seems that we have internalism and form of externalism, reliabilism, empiricism and non-empiricism and skepticism and realism. Uh, this dichotomy, my, my first reaction, my first uh, intuition was that they were about a particular scientist and then I was at some point in the paper I was thinking, no, it's not about a particular scientist, it's about the whole community of scientists. <coughs> and then I was trying to put some order on this and then I thought, okay, maybe internalism, externalism is more um, oriented into the individual level of each uh, scientist, but not necessarily. Empiricism and rationalism or, or non-empiricism can go in the two different levels, I guess, and skepticism and realism also can be justified for a particular individual and for the, and for the community. Uh, so there's, I guess, the, whether we choose one or, or the other level, we will be situated in two different debates. One is epistemology and the other is philosophy of science, which of course will have connections between them. Um, but in epistemology, when we talk about um, unobservables, maybe we talk about different things uh, to what we talk about on unobservables in the scientific community. So my, my first comment and question is about where to situate these, uh, these dichotomies, at, what, at which level. And, and in particular, I was thinking of whether it's possible to have different responses on depending on where we, if we are in one level or another. For instance, uh, we could say that a particular uh, scientist should be externalist because he should rely on what other people said, um, reliabilist and realist. However, the whole community of, of scientists should be uh, empiricist because someone somewhere has to have the particular experience for one particular uh, justification for something. That's right. So, uh, yeah, a quick look. That's really perceptive, and that's quite right. And it's uh, 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 to, to identify the, the, the social and the individual, and that's something that in the book that relates to this talk, I do go into in more more <coughs> detail. So you're absolutely right. That's uh, that's. Um, an important point. That said, um, my view about the community is actually that the community is itself very much like an individual and that what one says about individual epistemology can be carried over to the community as a whole. But I do, do, I do in fact have a section on whether one, as it were, whether the, Exactly what you said, whether in some senses empiricism could be true for the mm -hmm. community. Um, of course, there are no two ways of looking at that. One is whether um, you think say, empiricism might be true for the community because some individuals must have had the relevant experiences, which is what, what you said. Um, but another thing you could also say, is there a community analogue for perception? 
Right. Um, so the um, yeah, and, and I think that that might be an interesting avenue to to explore. But let's talk about what you suggested, which is as a community as a whole, is it necessary that some individuals have had some experiences? Well, I'm not even sure that's true, unless you think of our community as this historically extended thing. Um, and that's part, yeah. So it doesn't mean, so I don't think any, might not, I don't certainly think it's not true that any <coughs> current individuals have to have any experiences, or recent individuals. Possibly, if you look at, possibly you could construct an argument that, as it were, we couldn't be where we are in science without past individuals having experiences and then they develop the first knowledge upon which subsequent science has built. But one of the, the bit I, I left out about uh, Van Frasten, we can, we can do that if we want, um, he, he emphasises the fact that perception plays a minimal role in much modern science. So just think about the Large Hadron Collider what do the scientists who discovered the Higgs boson, what did they see? They saw their computer screens. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, well, is that important? <laughs> right. um, it doesn't seem to me that an epistemology of science needs to have a special place for looking at your computer. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, so that's, that's why, on the other hand, it might be that, as it were, if you think of the, the community historically extended, it, there is an important place for Galileo <coughs> having his experiences, whether that's you know, of falling cannonballs or through a telescope and so forth. But you know, I think that there might, you might, there might be a version of your argument that says, Though some past historical experiences were essential, but I don't think they are now. Okay. okay. Um, I think that um, the next comments, maybe they are a bit related, maybe they are guided by a bit the same intuition, but um, <clears throat> they are more focused on the, on the pessimistic deduction mm. and on the particular uh, terms that, they are, that are used in the, in the pessimistic deduction. In particular, uh, so premise, so the problem is that we have premise one, premise two, in which we use observable and unobservable, and then we cannot go from, or we have problems in justifying how we go from observable to unobservable, uh, in a very particular sense of observable. Um, <coughs> So my first uh, reaction about the, or, or one uh, comment I have about this is about the distinction between perception and instruments, because we, we use uh, the notion of, of observable using the notion of perception, and at some point in, in the paper uh, there is an intuition that I completely share, and I think it's, it's very interesting, that says um, that senses are just one among many of the instruments we have. So there is no privilege sense, mm -hmm. the, the privilege uh, role in, in, in our senses. This made me think, well, if that's the case, then maybe we don't have a clear um, distinction between what is observable and what is unobservable. Um, <clears throat> is it observable something? So there are clearly situations in which things are observable. I can observe the computer, however, if I'm very myop or I have very uh, strong uh, problems in my and then I get some surgery this surgery has modified my perception of, of what I can see but then I can put glasses or then I can I can refine more and more the, the way I see or the way I feel in my skin or mm -hmm. any sense so given that it can be difficult to have a sharp distinction between the two. I was wondering whether this could make a problem, could put a problem in the distinction between observable and unobservable. So I guess my question is to to know a bit more about this distinction. Right. Um, 
Yeah. Um, so the sorts of things that you're talking about is, 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 you know, you're, uh, are indeed the sort of things that have, in philosophy of science, people have been arguing about. But they argue about it in precisely the, the area that uh, you're discussing, which is you know, in connection with perception. You know, what's the limits of perception? Does using a telescope count? Uh, um, um, you know, or, or, or you have is surgery to improve your eyesight. You know, I, I, I actually agree that all these things put pressure on the unobservable, observable, unobservable distinction is, is used here with this, with this subscript P. And I suppose one of the things that I'm interested in saying is, well, since I reject the first premise, mm -hmm. in some sense I'm not so interested in I'm not that yeah. question. Um, still, that's not to say that I haven't got a distinction. Right? I just locate it somewhere completely different, right? Because um, I distinguish between the observable and the unobservable um, because it is part of the job of science to help us find out about things that we regard currently as unobservable. Uh, um, but, um, yeah, and so in, in, the, uh, in the book I have a... a, a, a try to give us an account of what I mean by uh, observable. Um, and it's roughly using the techniques of science to generate knowledge that will be evidence in the relevant area of inquiry. So, it's a, so, 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 so observation is a matter of evidence generation. Mm -hmm. I mean, and generating knowledge, you know, I, I, evidence and knowledge for me are the, are, are the same. It, and, and it's not related to perception, obviously. Um, so it's... So roughly speaking, um, it's not the distinction between what's... It's not a global distinction, general distinction between infer inferable, non non inferred. I mean, that's one way you could draw it. Yeah. So, the observable the observation is a matter of what you know without inference. Then you get to make inferences to the unobservable. It's something like that, but as a word, it's relativized to fields of in 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 inquiry. Because in fact, making observations of gravitational waves involves tons of inference. But that inference is all highly reliable and it's built into the process. It's not speculative inference. Uh, it's, it's inference that, as it were, we make in a highly reliable way to produce evidence which then will be used in, as it were, slightly more speculative inferences. Well, possibly what might start out of as more speculative inferences about, you know, we can use gravitational waves to make inferences about the truth of, or possible not truth of, general relativity. That's why these things are observations, because you know, we regard our, uh, our, the process of thinking of this observation utterly reliable, not utterly, you know, as rel highly reliable, as ways of generating evidence. If it was, if it was unreliable, or only speculative, or, then we wouldn't regard it as generating evidence that we could use for some other purpose. That's different. That's where I, that's, so it's not a very articulate <coughs> answer, but that's where I locate, locate the difference. It's, it's, as it were, the, it's the edges of reliability, you know, within what's reliable, producing evidence to make inferences at the, where we're being a bit more speculative. Okay. I, yeah, I, I wonder, I think that uh, somehow, but my second and third comment were very connected, so I don't know if you already answered. So I'm going to slightly change and I will mix my third and fourth comment. Um, it's more general about the, the um, how would not philosophers of science, but scientists um, think about these things, and in particular about this, this argument. Uh, if we forget about the, the particular notion of observable that relies on perception, and given your last comments in the paper and 
you also commented this at the beginning of the of the paper of how the how scientists talk about observation of waves, observation of this, observation of that, things that we consider unobservable. Um, in the paper, it's claimed that this uh, is a rejection of premise one. Mm -hmm. However, I was thinking that also a rejection of premise two <laughs> in, in, in light of the right. scientists. They could say, we start with observations and we conclude other observations. Um, but yeah, yeah, you could get, yes, you are, that, that <coughs> is related. Of course, that is related to what I've just said. So I think that there's there's something right about that, um, and I think, as it were, that um, the conclusions do concern observations when we can when it's the case that those conclusions have been brought about by processes that we regard as as as, as, as entirely reliable, so that what we get out at the end we're confident about using as evidence for the next process of science. So, so, it's, so, so something will change from being an unobservable to an, observ to an observable, depending upon the reliability with which we can generate the information about it. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Um, yeah, so once upon a time, atom, yeah, electrons and atoms were unobservable because you given the evidence that we had at the time, it was a little bit speculative. And, but once we were utterly co convinced that we were doing what we were doing, then, then, we, then, we, then we observe these things all the time. And, and that's why we can use electron microscopes. So. OK, I think I should stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Question, comments? I've got one. I think I can infer from your first, from your answer to Pilar's first comment, how you'll, how you'll answer it, but I want to ask it anyway. Um, because one, one argument in the vicinity that I wonder how you would, I wonder how you would reply to, um, and you'll catch this floating around the philosophy of biology literature sometimes. I'll see it in sort of uncritical forms occasionally from people like Denitor Dawkins, right, who give this sort of empiricist argument for an empiricist reliabilism, where essentially things bottom out in natural selection, right? So you go, look, we're, brain, we're, we're embodied brains in hunks of meat. Um, what could guarantee the reliability of, pro of, of, of anything winding up inside, inside a brain? Um, it's got to be something like um, repeated connection with the external world refined by natural selection or something on this order because that's the only kind of process that we know of that's at work in the world around us to do that kind of refining over time. So at the end of the day we're justified in something that feels like empiricism um, on those kinds of bases. Now I predict that you're going to disagree with the definition of empiricism in play. but. I just wonder what you, because it's a, it's, a, it's a neighboring argument, and I at least, I've never known what to do with this argument. That's why I'm interested in asking. Um, um, what do I think about that argument? Um, look, what happens if I say, look, I quite like, I quite like that argument. Um, um, look, I can imagine there. The, look, I, 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 I can imagine there are some some uh, responses to it that that someone who might not be quite so reliable as or so, so, so or, you know, slightly sceptical responses on terms. Well, it just has to be you know, good enough in the context and right, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean truth. Uh, something with less than truth might get us, you know, get us. Survive, dot dot dot. Um, but okay, but what's it got to do with empiricism? That's the, the question. So look, I mean, I think that that, 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 that the, the say you bought that argument, that would be a good argument for thinking um, <coughs> that we have perceptual apparatuses, senses that, that generally deliver the truth, at least in normal circumstances, you know, evolutionarily like <laughs> circumstances, yeah. circumstances like the ones under which these capacities were evolved, um, 
Okay, so what does that tell us about empiricism as a philosophical thesis? Um, and does it, I mean, does that, it doesn't follow from that that we um, have to ground everything in experience. It might tend towards something like what Peter and I ended up discussing that perhaps historically as a community, we, it's, you know, perhaps experience plays a whole, whole historically. Uh, and, and this is helpful for that view. <coughs> yeah, that's sort of, that could be a kind of empiricism that might come out of our discussion that would be supported by this kind of argument. But as it were, it doesn't tell us that. I mean, I mean, this is part of my argument towards the end. Yes, I regard, and, and, and Peter quoted quote some, some of the stuff I said about this in the paper. I regard, so, so some realists, this is slightly getting off topic, but I hope it's a little that some regard, regard use of instruments and so forth as ways of extending our senses. You know, like, think like a telescope, right? Okay, yes. Yeah, like, helps us like being, like being closer to the thing, right? It's extending our senses. Yeah, I think that that's actually the telescope is, is a poor um, um, example because actually most instruments in science don't extend our senses, they replace our senses. Or they do something our, stuff our senses never could do in the first place. You know, like gas meter for detecting uh, 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 magnetic fields. I mean, some animals actually can detect, you know, but we can't, I don't think. Uh, um, so, um, so why, why did I mention that? Um, Look, so, so, so you, where, where does the Dennett Dawkins argument get us there? So I just feel that, yeah, yeah what, what, what did, going back to what I said at the beginning, right, okay, good. It tells us that they're pretty reliable for some constrained circumstances. But the point about science is we want to get beyond those circumstances. We want to get to, into, into realms where the, that, that stuff has never evolved to deal with, right? And so we need to do something different. And that's why we have instruments and fancy theories and the rest of it. And that's to replace, in many cases, or do stuff that our senses never did before. Okay. okay, I have a few, but I will, I will ask one maybe later. So I was, I was, I was surprised about always your argument about the. Um, not, not about the argument, but about the, the third option. The oh, yeah. Uh, option. yeah, yeah, good, 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 yeah, yeah. Because, because what you're asking here is for an a priori justification, so in, in a certain way to be able to a priori prove something about the external world, so to produce knowledge about the yeah, external yeah, yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no rationalist of, would argue that it's possible today. So most rationalists would say we have some cognitive structure that is innate, right. certain, and these are necessarily acting when we acquire knowledge. But it's not obvious that we can acquire knowledge about this structure. Think about uh, um, general grammar and linguistic or things like that. So there's a structure, cognitive structure that is there, but. But it's not strong enough to produce knowledge by itself. Mm -hmm. So you need some input from from the empirical world. So I, it, so it's not incompatible with their second option. So so it's not empiricist. It could be realist, but it's not obvious to me that there's not an internalist position there uh -huh. about this kind of rationalist that they could be internalist. You think? I don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm asking you. Right, okay, right, right, right. <laughs> right, right, look, good, I think... You're not then persistent in your sense, that, that's clear. That is, yeah. that, that's absolutely clear. Um, and they could not be real, real they are reliable, yeah, reliable. reliable in the spirit, but they cannot produce knowledge based on this uh, because this cognitive structure is there. It's not necessarily that you can know it a priori. So it's there. It's it's it's, right, it's right, like right. a neo-Kantian. It's sure, just frame sure. frame your experience. Completely. Right. But but we can but 
what we could do is link it with the could be could be the stuff could be uh, and could be produced by evolution yeah yeah and then mm -hmm. so that's the reason for thinking that in fact that when look I mean I think this is I guess I actually the view I believe I think you know that 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 that, that um, these structures are, are evolved ones and one of the reasons why they're evolved is so that actually small amounts of information can multiply them. <laughs> yeah. 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 But the distinction yeah. with the Dennett argument, right. the Dennett argument is right. that we can we can produce knowledge, scientific knowledge on this structure using this structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a Neo Kantian would say, no. Okay, well how do you know that? How 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 could you do this circular? Well, see, so yeah, when, when the old can, when when you, that that's when they're being internalist, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, if you didn't make that move, I think you could be right with next term. Okay, okay. I think. Okay. My 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 temptation is to think that, as I said, that there's there's some as a liberalised version of empiricism with which I don't have an argument, which is. Well, yeah, I'm, or at least I'm not arguing here, which is all you have to be connected to the world, have interacted with the world to know stuff. Um, um, uh, uh, that's also, I think that's the way that that's the way that probably somebody like Dawkins would probably would try to push back, right? right, right would right, say right. like, well, I can at least show you that the there, you know. The right kind of sense perceptions have to be in the causal network somewhere, somehow, for stuff to have entered my brain, and then so that's enough to suffice as empiricism. Okay. But that the, you're, you're right. That sure. maybe, maybe that evacuates empiricism so much that there's not much well, interesting I, left on the table. I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not. not <laughs> but even on the other hand, you, see, that you might get into, you might say, look, no, no, here's this, here's as it were, the sort of where rationalism is by, uh, yeah. It's this left behind, as it were, the origins that I was talking about, which was the certainty, dot, 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 but there's, yeah, the, 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 there is innate structures that, in some sense, encapsulate knowledge, or at least enable us to generate knowledge from small quantities of empirical input. Yeah, um, more than can be just deduced from those inputs on their own. Um, um, and then, in a sense, yeah, in a sense, I think that the both that that does it well. That there's a successor to, to rationalism, and there's the like there's a parallel successor to empiricism. And indeed, you could, uh, uh, and I don't, I, in so there's some ways of describing both of them that, that make neither of them internalists, but it depends. Uh, um, in which case, I'm, fi I'm fine with both of them. I mean, and then and then they can fight it out, or they can come to some. They can come to some um, kind of accommodation, like, which is just sort of suspect is what evolutionary theory does for us. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to have some of these things. Good, good, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Good, thank you. We know. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron, for your talk. Um, I've got a very large but tough question. <laughs> it's about the, the internalist externalist distinction. Um, because I think that uh, it's often with internalism, so you ask that the, the, the person, the, him or herself, has got all arguments with you in order to justify his or her beliefs. And justify it, uh, justify them. Uh, it means deductively justify them. You you will need sufficient reasons mm -hmm. for having these beliefs, which is surely too required. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, externally just makes the, the person uh, not having the reasons in mm his -hmm. hands or her hands mm -hmm. uh, in order to, to justify his or her beliefs. Well, I, I think that if I see you in front of me, that's a quite good reason to think that you are there. Uh, even though it's not probably a deductive sufficient reason. Uh, but you know, it motivates my belief. It provides good reasons, but not probably sufficient reasons. And the same, same way, like, 
uh, induction. Probably induction is not directly valid. But of course, having lots of experiments going the same way provides you good reasons, yet not sufficient reasons to have this belief. So, of course, if we want an internalism to have deductive justification, it's too requiring, and then we would like to go to for externalism. But is, 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 is it not just because it's too requiring to have uh, deductive justification in, in the case of internalism? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that that's why there is this close connection between internalism and scepticism. Mm -hmm. Because it is too, 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 too required, too demanding. Um, however, I think you, you're also right in implying this from what you're saying that simple reliableism isn't demanding enough. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what we see as a result is that, and, and Sanford Goldberg's response to the case of testimony is an example of this, what we see is um, reliableists, sophisticated reliableists, build in a little bit more to their versions of reliableism that make it not quite, you make it a little bit more demanding than the simple version. For example, that in his case it was, I can, I have some reliable way of, it, again, this might not be something of which I'm aware, but I do in fact distinguish between reliable and unreliable sources. Uh, um, and so I think that, I think you put your, your finger on it, that, that, that it's, it's the question, how, how much should we require? Um, and my view is that in, it seems that in science, and we talked about this at one point, yeah. and in other areas, that we require more than the simple reliableist, but not enough to satisfy the, the internalist. Um, yeah, so I think that that's, I think that what you say is, is yeah, I think that's right. I think, I think what you, so, but, but did, um, <laughs> Oh, I have no answer. Yeah, no answer. Right. Okay, right, right, right. Just, just, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just have seen that quite a lot of time. We, we are often very demanding for yeah. for internalists. But no, I agree. But I think think that you see, I think that part of our knowledge is not deductively justified, and probably does not have to. I think I agree. I agree. But that's why I think that um, but it's funny though, isn't it? You know, so if you think about children and animals, your children and animals' favourite you know, externalists love animals and children. We're very nice people. Um, we like children and animals because children and animals aren't reflective. But we want to say that children and animals know stuff. And if you th think, and, and the kind of notion of justification with which the externalist likes to work is one that is, yeah, if you know something, you're justified. Yeah, the, 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 um, so there's a sense in which children are justified in believing things, even though yeah, they haven't really thought about them a whole lot. Um, um, they haven't got, certainly haven't gone through any internal reflection on their belief producing processes, nor are they in a position to do so. Um, so, but what, so it's interesting that when it comes to adults and in particular to scientists that we do get more demanding than we, you know, we think that scientists should know stuff about their methods. but. Again, for the reasons you said, not not as, not so requiring, not so demanding that they get as far as the internalist would require them to be. But that's then that's why internalism, you know, if you follow it through, will tend to lead to scepticism, unless you can be super duper clever and come up with some a priori, the deductive 
uh, justification of induction and all these other things. But uh, yeah, but what I've been arguing is that all those views are a bit hopeless, really. So I agree. I, I, I mean, I, I, I may agree with you, but but I but um, but that, but on the other hand, I don't. I think that there's a sense in there's a sense in which, from the externalist perspective, <coughs> a whole bunch of evidence is sufficient. Yeah, without a deduction. That's what the externalist, that's the reliabilist is, is, is saying. If you've got enough evidence and you reason inductively, that's sufficient, that's enough. I mean, it's, it's not deductively sufficient, but it is sufficient for you to get to know or to be justified. And could, not, could it not be possible for an internalist not to be deductivist? I mean, to, to, no. to, 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 to claim that he can reason, reason on, uh, on the basis of some evidence I see. and infer some consequences while knowing that there are not deductive consequences. So that uh, he has got justification for some of his or her conclusions that he, on which he or her, she reasons, but, but with, without the, the same kind of deductive justification that leads to absolute certainty. Right, yeah, I mean, I think some people have tried this um, in different ways. I mean, Strawson tries it in, you know, in a sort of typical analytic philosopher's kind of way. He says, that's just what it re means to be justified or be reasonable. Mm -hmm. it mean, being reasonable just means you believing something when but only when you've got a, a decent body of evidence, right? Um, um, yeah, so the, yeah, that, there are moves that are made, made like that. And I, I just I think they're sort of missing the, the point because that's the, 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 as of what the skeptical challenge is being made is, look, I don't care whether my conclusion is called reasonable. What I want is, you know, what I mean, what I want is you know, have some reason to think it's likely to be true. And that's the notion of justification I'm interested in, is one which is you know, correlated with truth. Yeah, being called reasonable, who cares? You know, it's just a word. But, uh, anyway, sorry, that's, this is getting slightly off the, off the topic, but I think that there are, you know, are attempts, but then there are also sort of Kantian ways of doing things, a bit more sophisticated than that. But, um, yeah. The neo hegelian like sellers, like random. Yeah. Like, position well, yourself in the space of reason. It's internalist. You don't have access to the reason. You cannot position yourself in the space of reasons and to get provide yeah, right. reasons. You're externalist. But you're right. They they don't claim to be realist. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. Hmm. Peter. Yeah. Um. I. I it's quite a kind of related, but um, I was wondering about this uh, this reliabilist strategy that you mentioned by Goldberg, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Bring me to, I'll get it up again. You, want like to you seem to be quite sympathetic towards it. Yes. Um, but um, I was wondering how you can avoid problems with accidental discrimination capacities. Like, if, if there is no good reason why, uh, well, why you are able to, to discriminate, but you happen to be able to discriminate, you happen to be successful in discriminating um, just by pure accident or by some uh, neural network that has like, uh, um, like some, not because of the real content, but because of, uh, uh, um, well, it, it has the kind of the right, so imagine uh, a neural network working on uh, on, on results of scientists and, and I mean if, if they kind of uh, uh, have the sort of the nice kind of grammar that, 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 that the good so that, that successful scientist uses and, and I don't know and, 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 and like they, they, they look sophisticated and maybe that's a good kind of maybe that correlates with reliability yeah. but actually this is just pure coincidence I mean at some point somebody who doesn't have this nice sophisticated language could exactly could exactly have the right sort of uh, insights uh, and the sophisticated person could be a fraud uh, um, yeah, right. and, and so, so, so it seems that there's some kind of there might be de you need deeper reasons 
for reliability, maybe I'm too internalist, but uh, 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 then, then just to be able to discriminate, I mean, you have to be able to discriminate, but also for a reason, it has to be an intentional discrimination and not just like extensionally making the right, right kind good. of cuts. That seems, that's my intuition, but. Good, good. I think, uh, good, I, that, that's, that's a good question. Uh, uh, but they've all been good, good, good questions. Um, so, um, I think that the notion of reliability here has to have some modal element to it. It's not simply that um, the criterion of discrimination that I'm using, in fact, distinguishes the uh, ooh, I don't know. Um, reliable from the unreliable, but you would do so in nearby circumstances. So it can't simply be, yeah, I, I trust only people that don't have beards, I don't trust you. you know. <laughs> right. um, and it turns out that in that for purely spurious reasons in this in the community where I engage people, the, the bearded people are unreliable and they clean shaved now. But yeah, clearly if you shaved, it wouldn't turn you into the yeah or, or vice versa. Yeah, or, or you, Charles, you know, well, so like, you know go a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that's right. So there has to be some so, modal, some something slightly modal about it. Nearby yeah, possible world, like, worlds as well. So the question is, but look, but even then you could say, look, it could, could turn out, um, you could, say, you might be able to run a version of your argument, even, even, so, um, I'm not sure what to say. I mean, I, I think at some point I just say, look, that. As long as you've got this modal bit in place, um, that's that's good enough. But I can, but I can see, but I can see how the temptation is to go, go is, is to go modal. And say, oh, no, 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 the, 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 ought to be able to give us some explanation of why they make this discrimination and why it's a good one to 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 to, to make. But I, I think at this point I can say no, no, that's just, just too internalist and I'm not. So that we might find that this is a, an area where we end up seeing where the internalist and externalist yeah. disagree. But but at that at that point our intuitions about is are, are, are going to be quite difficult to just. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I see, I, I see exactly what you're saying. But, but the model. I mean, I don't think. I think it, it's important to find to have the model the model bit specified exactly. And not just uh, 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 left to some sort of, because that, that's right. what the philosophers always do. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, no, like uh, you need the modal thing, and you need it. You need to make it intentional and so on. But then, what that exactly comes to is not very certain and, and not very clear. And I mean, it, it seems to like what kind of modality would be using then uh, sort of uh, a physical modality, or I don't know. Uh, I mean, there's all of kind of problems that always show up when you're invoking modality that 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 make it not so obvious uh, and, and and i think once you can settle once you have a good approach a good answer to that a good a good kind of modality that that does the work then i mean i, I might i might find it also quite an attractive view uh, but it's not trivial it's work that needs to be done uh, look, I, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree with that. But I think it can be done. I mean, so I, I guess it, one 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 test for this, whether you think whether you are sympathetic to the thought it can be done, is you know the, the whole ch chicken sexing thing. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Chicken sexing. I mean, uh, this it's complicated. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm not sure I get this exactly right, and, and but it's one of these things that's got you know, the the. the, the being a bit garbled by by philosophers, and that will include me. But the, this, the, the, uh, that people are, are 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 trained to distinguish chicks that 
are male from female, the, 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 but they're virtually they're, they're indistinguishable. They seem, seem to be indistinguishable. Um, but this is important because you don't want to allow the male chicks to you don't want to feed them and because you want only the female chicks to go to hens and lay eggs and, and so forth. So <laughs> get rid of the other ones. Uh, uh, anyway. But um, um, you, ap apparently you can train people to do this and say this is a, a, a male one, this is a female one and, you keep, and then you get them to guess and then they guess randomly to begin with but you no no that's wrong that's right and after a while they get quite reliable about 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 this um and in fact for some time wasn't known quite why they could do this but apparently it turns out that they are detect some that they there's they are detecting something in the smell or it smells slightly different but they don't know that right it's just so subliminal levels of julia's looking very doubtful about what i'm <laughs> probably talking rubbish now <laughs> But, but if it's not true, just there's a possible world where. Right? <laughs> uh, 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 um, and then the, 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 question, the question is whether um, you know, these check. This looks like a. This is the kind of reliable discrimination I'm talking about here. They, they, these people can distinct, discriminate between the, the, the female and male chicks. They can't tell you why, how they do it. Yeah. But you know, the sense in which you want to say they don't know which is which. I don't know. Honestly, I'm glad to say they know which is which. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that helps really. Yeah. 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 yeah that makes it. Okay. Thanks. Should we ask uh, about Van Frassen? Do we say okay? Okay. Go. <laughs> I thought it's a very good empiricist and journalist, non-realist. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So here, here here's why. Uh, but I, I sort of, I sort of. So this is where I was. Okay, catching sorry. the slides over your yeah, shoulder. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. good. Um, so, yeah, Van Frassen, in, in in the way that this premise was intended, Van Frassen rejects this because we don't believe the conclusions of science. We merely accept them. We take them to be, or believe that they are empirically adequate. So, since we don't, the conclusions acquire what we believe don't concern what's unobservable. So. So he might just get off this whole thing there. Okay, so I, I gave the example of the Large Hadron Collider and the Atlas experiments there. So you know, what does the scientist actually look at when she's doing her science? What, you know, what does she see? She's not like she's, you know, she's looking at a cathode ray tube uh, like, you, like her, her, her sort of predecessors would have, uh, have, have been, nor even at a photograph of a cloud chamber, right? She, the Large Hadron Collider, the beams of particles which are whacked together, if, if you, are, you want to start up being anti with particles, yeah, these beams are, the, the, uh, this machine is constructed, right? And you turn a switch, a switch on and stuff happens, and there are these, you know, an amazing array of, um, um, instruments for picking up the decay particles, decay products of uh, these collisions, or at least that's what the realists would be, 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 be saying. Um, and um, um, okay, um, and in fact, there's so much data produced. I mean, this is all electronic. This is all electronic, and there's so much data produced. Apparently, that if you were to run these Atlas experiments for six days and collect all the data, it would fill up the whole internet. Right? Uh, and obviously, they can't keep all that data. So this is they've got highly theory laden means of in real time analysing it and throwing away most of it and hanging on just to you know, the data that's important or the conclusions of certain bits of analysis. Then it all ends up in a huge, great database, which the scientists then interrogate the database using fancy statistical software run on their you know, laptops, right? Okay. So, um, yeah. so, so we're saying the, the, the perceptual experience of the um, scientist is limited to what she sees on her, or can be, 
and pretty much it. It's limited to what she sees on her screen. Okay, so um, what? How? How should you understand what's going on if you're Van Frossen? Right? Um, so, um, or even if that, for that matter, if you're Quine, given that quote. Yeah, about you know, predicting future experience in the light of past experience. Um, so, really, what yeah, for both of them? Really, the aim of science is to produce theories. Um, we don't believe those theories, but what they can, they, they are, they are um, taken to be empirically adequate, which means that they correctly predict our experiences. That's to say, they will correctly predict what the scientist sees when she opens her laptop yeah, and, and types in certain order, yeah, instructions in, and then some stuff will happen. Um, and you have to think, hang on, we've just spent billions, right? <laughs> billions in order to... Um, get to, 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 to be able to know the truth of certain sort of conditionals of the form of if you were to build an extremely expensive <laughs> thing to this specification, <laughs> attach your laptop to the dot dot dot, dot open up this software, and type these all or type these commands, you would see a screen that looks like this. Right. Now, I, that, 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 that it sounds like I'm being facetious. I'm to be trivialising it, but actually, I can't really see what else the constructive empiricist thinks is going on in this highly computerised modern science. Yeah, I had a different example in, in, in this paper on regarding radio astronomy, but it's much the same thing, right? Yeah, you've got this sophisticated piece of equipment that you generate data in a database and you interrogate that data using soft software. And there's nothing like looking through a telescope, or, or let alone seeing some, seeing a sample with your own eyes. It's just anyway. So uh, I, I, sim I think I think it reduces science to a it, 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 it's difficult to see that it makes any science it makes the aim of science plausible. That's the argument. That's the argument. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit late. I think, I think you believe that Coyne and Van Fraisen are instrumentalist, which they are not. So uh, they maybe have a, a little bit more sophisticated answer, but I think yeah, yeah, I, I love we it. are at the end of our time <laughs> and we could finish this discussion around a beer. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, probably the best place to discuss. Thank you very <laughs> much, Alexander. Thank you very much, Pilar. Yeah, thank you, Pilar. Yes, 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 yes.